So welcome to uh, to my podcast. This is Julia Val speaking. How to live, and today we'll have the pleasure of uh, uh, being in conversation with uh, Paul Gilbert, Professor Paul Gilbert, who is a renowned writer. Uh, I've uh, I've lost track uh, in terms of how many uh, books you've uh, written, uh, Paul. How many papers you've published? Uh, but maybe in a, in a few moments you can uh, you can tell us more about it. And of course, Paul is uh, is mainly known uh, uh, these days, I, I think, as the founder of uh, CFT, which stands for Compassion Focused uh, Therapy. So, Paul, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor. And it's a pleasure to be with you, Julia. And uh, yes, because we know each other for a while, so it's a great <laughs> pleasure to be with you. It's and you know, if you don't mind saying maybe a few words about yourself, Paul, and about your recent uh, activities, uh, if uh, there's anything you'd like to maybe emphasize. Yeah, so thank you, Julia. So we're very interested in um, bringing compassion to how we develop our minds and our brains. And um, we see compassion very much as linked to an evolved system of caring. So mm. many species care for their offspring, don't they, and care for each other to some degree. And that means that in when we are in caring mode, mm. caring mind states, our brain and our body is in a particular state as well. When we're in stress, if we can learn mm. to shift our minds back into a compassion focus, which we can talk about a little mm. later, um, this helps us to stabilize things in the body and the brain. So what is compassion? Well, compassion is basically when we are sensitive to our suffering and pain mm -hmm. and that of others. We're sensitive to it. We are prepared to engage and try to understand it. We don't run away from it. And then work out way, wise and courageous ways of being helpful, how to be helpful. So mm -hmm. one of the mottos then is how can we live to be helpful, not harmful, because we can be very harmful to ourselves and to others. So that's basically what we're doing with compassion. And uh, some of our habits, like our eating or drinking habits, are not very, uh, mm. <laughs> very helpful to us, are they? So doing things that we know are going to be helpful to us and to others is really at the heart of what compassion is about. Mm. Um, we are familiar with, uh, with uh, CFT, Compassion Focused Therapy, but for some of our uh, listeners who might not be as familiar with this uh, uh, specific approach, why do we need uh, 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 this particular type of therapy as there are so many other uh, uh, paradigms already? So why, uh, and in a way you've uh, explained it, to, uh, explained it uh, just a moment uh, uh, ago, uh, but if we can uh, dig into that uh, a bit more. So why, why my compassion focused therapy okay great great question julia so we call it compassion focused sorry we call it compassion focused mm. therapy not compassion therapy there are mm -hmm. therapies that are compassion mm. therapy but what we mean by compassion focused therapy it means that many of the techniques of intervention such as in cognitive mm. therapy or emotion focused therapy emdr a whole range of them they're all very useful when they serve the purpose of helping people mm -hmm. So we're not developing all new techniques, but mm. what we suggest is that if people develop a compassion motivation and a compassion orientation to mm. these techniques, it will help them. So, for example, supposing you were doing work with trauma and you're helping mm. people to engage mm. with trauma memory, if they know how to go into a compassionate mind state, which stimulates the vagus and the frontal cortex, mm. As they go into the trauma, mm. they will be taken into the trauma. Physiological systems are biologically designed mm. to downregulate threat sensitivity. This is because these systems evolve with the attachment system. Mm. And one of the things the attachment system does is that when the child is distressed or upset, they go to mum or dad, usually mum, and mum then says some nice things to them, mm -hmm. which calms them down. Relationships, affiliative relationships, mm -hmm very powerful calming impacts if you're upset and you go and talk to somebody who's a friend of yours and they put an arm around you and they listen and they validate mm -hmm. you that will calm you so there are things in your brain based in the care system that has a specific effect on calming so then you can do a lot of the trauma uh, engagement and mm -hmm. exposure but if you do it with this compassionate mind state mm. uh, it works better and uh, in our view and it lasts longer 
Hmm. So maybe a more general uh, question uh, in terms of psycho psychotherapy, uh, as we're uh, discussing why maybe at times we, we need a, a slightly uh, different approach. So, so uh, a question in terms of uh, a quo vadi. So uh, where are we going or where should we going in terms of uh, uh, the direction of, of uh, maybe developing or improving our existing uh, therapeutic models? So um uh, at times i think we uh, there's this uh, danger of sex therapy becoming its own caricature so uh creating more separation from from others and uh, that's actually the uh, the narrative that's uh, that's uh, becoming more more uh, present these days so a form of fostering individualism uh, rather than connecting being more connected to others encouraging this type of uh, uh of 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 us being uh um so um um you know therapy as a hell a self help uh, in the spirit i can do it on my own so uh uh where do you think uh, uh therapy uh, is going or should be going what needs to be changed uh, or maybe uh, amended improved in terms of uh, future therapeutic paradigms or the way of, of doing therapy in fact well it Yes, I mean, you've got a lot of very interesting questions there. The yeah. first one really is, I think, that the therapy needs to be much more science-based. One of the problems that we've got is that um, we've got all these different mm -hmm. tribes. So some people are doing compassion focus, some mm -hmm. people are doing mm -hmm. behavior stuff, some people are doing cognitive stuff, mm -hmm. some people are doing embodied stuff. You need to do it all. And, mm -hmm. and you need to do it in a way that it interacts because actually minds don't make distinctions <laughs> between yeah. like, cognitive emotions and so on. So we argue that part of the problem mm -hmm with um, the tribes of psychotherapy is that they're not really rooted in the science. Mm. If they're rooted in the science, then we have four basic functions of mind. That's the motives, our motivational mm -hmm. systems, which are partly to do with evolved functions, to do with threat sensitivity and competing and so on. Then we have emotions, which are the changes in bodily states that come and go. They get turned on and get turned off according by circumstances. Motives are not there by circumstance they're there because they're mm -hmm. you know you know the need to defend yourself mm -hmm. is always there the need to form positive relationships mm -hmm. is always there that doesn't come and go and then you have competencies which is to do with the way mm -hmm. in which you think and mindfulness all of that stuff mm -hmm. and then you have behaviors so if you're going to have so the future of psychotherapy really mm -hmm. is to understand how the mind works as a system not in these little mm -hmm. bits and also mm -hmm. It has to be biopsychosocial because we've got data now that if physiological mm. systems don't change, then people don't change. Mm. So we've got there's a, some studies in America showing that if people do CFT and they don't get much in the way of heart rate variability change, they don't actually change. So, and as you know, th th there's a lot of work going on now looking at what mm. happens in your brain when you practice loving kindness meditations. Mm. Your brain changes, right? So the future of psychotherapy is going to be much more science-based in the basic processes of mind mm -hmm. and much more integrated with physiological systems, particularly in the body, which is sometimes called embodiment. And that's an integrating and integrated process. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes we're called, called a third wave of cognitive therapy. Mm -hmm. We've never been that. That's mm -hmm. partly because we use all of the waves, the first, second, and you know, there's a lot of Becky and mm -hmm. stuff and C CFT as well. But we also use a lot of psychodynamic ideas and, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. So I, I'm with you on this. I don't mm -hmm. think we should be putting therapies in these boxes and then mm -hmm. putting them in the, in the boxing ring and see how they sort of beat out <laughs> who's going to win. I don't think that. I think we need a basic science. Mm -hmm. What are motivational processes? How do you change people's motivations? How do you change people who are narcissistic? How do you help them to become more interested, mm. more compassion oriented, more empathic, right? Mm. Uh, for those who that are very submissive, how do you help them become more assertive, more, more self-focused mm. in some ways? Mm. So the point that you make, I think, is a really important one, that we need more, mm. we need a better basic mm. sciences approach to the mind. And maybe one handbook for uh, for uh, all types of psych therapies. And you actually mentioned yourself in one of our previous conversations. I think it was a conversation with uh, Adam Eljanowski uh, that uh, you know it's it's just uh, ridiculous that. Uh, 
Uh, we have so many different handbooks for different therapies where, you know, uh, uh, whereas when you were studying medicine, you have this one uh, handbook because that's the one medicine. You know, we're not diff- you know, yeah. practicing you know, uh, you know, different types of, 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 uh, of, of practices. Um, but going back to, to CFT itself, so what re- kind of research uh, uh, is still needed? Uh, uh, what kind of research on what types of uh, maybe issues, uh, applications of CF- uh, CFT? Uh, what should we study further uh, in terms of uh, 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 CFT. Uh, do we need to, to know anything else uh, in terms of the mechanism? And that's actually another question, my second question. Uh, so first about the, the uh, any further studies or explorations and uh, then the mechanism of CFT. Do we need to uh, learn more, Paul? Well, yes, of course. That's a good question, Julia. And that's always, always the case. There's always, mm. you know, we're all at the beginning of our mm-hmm. journey of understanding, of course. Um, so there are a couple of very interesting things. Um, <clears throat> one is that we all started as a process therapy, so we wanted to understand the processes mm. of self-criticism and get into the detail. And now we know that there are three or four different types of self-criticism, and they mm. need, you know, self-hatred is different mm. from those individuals mm. who are worried about mm. being inadequate, and they feel mm. they are good, but they're not making the best of them. They let themselves down. They could do better mm. than that. They're very different from the self-haters who are the people that come from the abuse and so on. So just understanding process mm-hmm. and, and uh, beginning to become much more subtle in our understanding mm-hmm. of the process. So we do need to do that. Mm-hmm. We do need to do work. For example, we know that individuals who come from abusive experiences mm-hmm. have different types of depression than those who come from neglect. Mm-hmm. And those who come from neglect they struggle with the drive system. They struggle with feeling you know, positive em- emotions. They are kind of very anodyne. They're flat, really. Mm-hmm. Now, people from abuse can also be flat, but they're much more threat-focused. They're closed mm-hmm. down because they see the world as a very frightening place, whereas the neglect see the world as a very empty place. Mm-hmm. So they're just making clarity about compassion is not one thing there's lots of Mm. different qualities and what qualities do you need so for example if you're training a firefighter Mm -hmm. the motivation is to save somebody but you're going to train them totally differently Mm -hmm. than if you're training a counselor (laughs) okay they both want to address Mm -hmm. suffering Mm -hmm. but they have very different skills and they're going to need very different types of courages so the idea that compassion is one thing and you just apply it no (laughs) there are very important very important individual aspects of Mm. compassion training and you have to develop your compassion intervention for that individual Mm. um i mean there are some generic trainings as you know breathing and imagery Mm. and so on but um also compassion for particular kinds of problems Mm. will be very much linked to that individual so individualizing the therapy i think is another very major area for further work so, so seeing uh, where to start with whom. So yes. uh, dif- okay. So uh, tailor made uh, uh, CFT practices for uh, for instance. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. So uh, and actually another question uh, popped into my in my mind uh, uh, in terms of of, of different connections or links, uh, compassion and you know shame, compassion and loneliness. So let's maybe focus on loneliness because. Uh, 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 this is a growing problem in 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 many uh, uh, West so-called Western uh, uh, cultures, industrialized cultures. So how these two um, uh, things are connected? So compassion and and loneliness, because there's a question that uh, often journalists ask me. So I <laughs> I was wondering about your answer to that question. You know, what's the link? Yes, yeah, so the first thing, the compassionate position is to understand why loneliness, loneliness is tricky. Hmm. And so, you know, the, the, in other words, in, in, in compassion, and indeed in, in many scientific hmm. approaches, you want to understand what's happening and the causes of what's hmm. happening. So that compassion is understanding what's happening and the causes. So we know that loneliness is bad for you in many um, accounts in terms hmm. physiologically, it's very bad for you. People are much more vulnerable to all kinds of physical conditions and so on. So why then? Well, we basically grew up, we basically evolved for about 2 million years in hunter-gatherer societies. And in these societies, you were in a group constantly. You were never out of the group. 
I mean, okay, you might go on a hunting trip and spend a night away or something like that. I don't know. But generally speaking, you were never alone. Mm -hmm. We're not designed to be alone. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sometimes, you know, people want to go off and do meditation retreats. That might be different. But our natural uh, brain requires Mm -hmm. the nutrients of regular social relationships. Okay. So loneliness and aloneness is an unnatural state. Now, of course, some people like to be alone, like to do things alone, but in general, Mm -hmm. And we know that COVID has been a terrible um, issue for creating loneliness. Mm. So the compassion approach then is firstly to understand how people understand that it's not their fault if they're alone, that loneliness will have these impacts, and then begin to understand, so what is it that's creating loneliness for you? Now, if it's um, often lack of opportunity, so COVID was lack, you couldn't, Mm. you weren't able to meet people. So there was, and many people, elderly people, you know, families have moved mm. away, they've gone to another country to work or to another town or something like that. So there's a lot of loneliness mm. in the elderly, and particularly individuals who may have lost a partner or whose mm. partner is perhaps dementing or whatever. Mm. So that's type of loneliness. Mm. Then there's the loneliness in younger people is often linked to things to do with social anxiety or shyness. Mm. And uh, is, um, social media can have a big mm. hand to play in all of that stuff. Mm. Uh, so social fear... Mm. Um, stops um, people coming to get social anxiety mm. stops people coming together and so on and so on um, so and loneliness in children can link to bullying and all kinds of things in the schools so there's lots of different dimensions mm. by which individuals can end up feeling isolated and alone mm. and it's you know if you're going to come up with solutions you've got to come up with a solution for that problem not just a generic solution so also, I, I guess, the shaming in terms of loneliness, understanding, as uh, yeah. uh, John Cassioppo and, or, or Stephanie Cassioppo would say, you know, it's the it's about the uh, uh, they actually refer to the to to the their theory, evolutionary uh, theory of loneliness, that it's actually uh, it's uh, actually uh, something to do uh, with our evolutionary heritage. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Yeah. It's an important information, you know, something is something is wrong. So we all need it. So the shaming in terms of understanding that's actually it's uh, it's a good thing that is working, that I'm now feeling lonely because that's uh, telling me something, maybe telling me to do something about it. Yes. Mm, OK. Yes. I mean, I agree. It's not, not necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily experience it as a good thing, mm-hmm. but um, it's like having vomiting and diarrhea. And these mm-hmm. are things that are designed to protect you from toxins. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if they go on and go on and go on, uh, then they can kill you because you have dehydration or whatever. So a lot of our defenses like loneliness are really designed mm. for short-term reuse, like anxiety, mm. short-term mm. use, that you then have to correct. Mm. Okay, so If you're anxious, you run away from the predator and you mm. either get away or you don't. <laughs> but they're not designed mm. for long-term use. Mm. Mm. And that's the problem in our society that a lot of our anxiety conditions And people get into these conditions Mm. and then they don't turn off. They don't have the mechanisms of turning them off or loneliness to be lonely Mm. for a short period of time is okay. But constantly month Mm. after month, year in, year out. No, that is abnormal. Mm. Uh, So, yes, it's a normal uh, um, warning that you need Mm. to get back into relationships. uh, But then you're supposed to do that. It's Mm. not supposed to be a feeling that you have for months on end. And could be even more uh, uh, difficult. Uh, it's quite tricky because you may be surrounded by so many people and thinking something is wrong with me. Because uh, in fact, yes, there are so many people. In fact, but uh, uh, there aren't uh, deep enough connections. You know, there isn't this uh, exchange. You know, so I always. Uh, uh, link this to to compassion. That's you know, I am able to receive and give. Yes. Uh, mm. uh, so, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, CFT and uh, and uh, uh, and its professionals, uh, how do you think the practice of uh, CFT can change the therapist, uh, uh, him, him or herself? Uh, how did it change? Uh, has it changed you, Paul? Uh, if I, I may ask such a personal uh, a, a question. <laughs> yes, you certainly certainly can, and. There's a book called uh, Compassion Focused Therapy from the Inside Out, which mm-hmm. advises um, therapists to, to, to do the practices. Mm-hmm. And as you know, we have a diploma and uh, a training, mm-hmm. and people say that over the year of doing the practices and the training it has changed them. You mm-hmm. know, it's, 
they've mellowed one person you know, described it as mellowing out softening mm. out and mm. just being much more easy with themselves and much more open to um, the ability to tolerate and deal with suffering just generally more confident more mm. easy mm. with one's own mind i think um so then the second question you asked is how does it help me it helps me quite a lot because I have my own personal practices. I do a lot of energizing, compassion, as you know, and um, also I have a Buddha in my garden, at the top of my garden. It's about three foot. Uh -huh. And sometimes if I get upset about things, I might go and talk to the Buddha and, and rant it. <laughs> there was life's all this bloody thing, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but um, then at the end of it, the most mm -hmm. important thing is at the end of it, you always thank the Buddha. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to my ranting. Okay. And that <laughs> process of then finishing your rant with gratitude mm -hmm. to be listened to, I find that a very helpful thing. So I can just go and swear and blast mm -hmm. off, say anything I want. Uh, but at the end, it's always thank you for mm -hmm. listening to me. Mm -hmm. And you imagine the Buddha just accepting mm -hmm. that whatever you are experiencing is part of being human, mm -hmm. right? And, that, and it's mm -hmm. tough difficult so the buddha just smiles back and you know you can imagine mm -hmm. it's just saying yeah it's all very tough isn't it so um these kind of practices a lot of imagery practices and a lot of mindfulness practices just trying to be fully present in the moment to the degree to which i can it doesn't always mm -hmm. work that well <laughs> and i often give an i often tell a story that of how it had helped me and uh and there, it was about 2008 something like that and um, I'd uh, been writing the book called The Compassionate Mind, and it got a bit long. I wanted to cut it down. And then, sadly, my father was dying of lung cancer, so I had to go and spend some time with the family and and so on. And then, you know, I was there when he passed away, and it's a bit traumatic. So then I came back to Derby, where I live, and um, of course the publisher was saying, where's the book? You know, we've got everything lined up, copy editing, everything. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, uh, I said, okay, so I tried to do some more work on it very quickly and then sent it off. And the day came for me to send it off. So I went to send it off mm. and the computer, for whatever reasons, to this day, I don't know, wouldn't send anything. So I just kept getting, you know, this failed, this has failed, this failed. So I ch checked the address. Yes, I've used this address many times. But okay, I break it all up into chapters. So I did all that, you know. So at this point, I had a complete and utter rage attack. Um, <laughs> so, screamed at the computer a bit like john cleese you know a lot, <laughs> lot of naughty words and uh, was in an absolute rage and um then i had to go to work so i stormed out the house and then i suddenly remembered oh no my wife's in the house she would have heard me screaming that this is my computer this is terrible and so then the critic turns up so i'm driving mm -hmm. and the critic turns up oh so you've just written a book on compassion have you <laughs> look at you you can't control anything. You're totally out of control, you know. You're crazy, you are. You're nuts. You're a fake writing all this mm -hmm. stuff. But anyhow, so I'm raging away, and then I'm raging away because I'm raging away. Then I'm attacking myself for raging. So you get into these loops, don't you? Mm -hmm. right? But then it was like almost a different, almost another character was in the car. There was this voice in my head that said, Paul, just slow down. It's not your fault, you know. Mm -hmm. This is not your Oh, it was this very calming voice. Look, mm. your father's died. It was pretty traumatic. Blah, 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 blah. You know, just slow down. Just go mm. and settle. Just settle yourself. It's okay. It's all right. We get rages. That's all right. It's okay. Just let, let your wife know. So it was this really calming voice. So I pulled to the side of the, the road and I had a little cry and I phoned my wife and she said, oh, thanks for phoning because I thought, what on earth has gone on, you know? Mm. Um, so... The point about it is if you practice compassion, mm -hmm. if you practice it, mm -hmm. then when uh, you do get very distressed, you can learn to switch into this and you can hear that mm -hmm. voice because that compassion needs to be there with you when it's difficult. It's not mm -hmm. all about let's it, compassion is for happiness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's okay if it is. Compassion is mm -hmm. there when it's really difficult, when perhaps mm -hmm. you've lost it a little bit or you become very frightened. Mm -hmm or whatever, compassion is the voice that brings you back to your center because mm. having a human mind is tough. Mm. It can get up to all kinds of stuff. We lose control mm. over it, you know, but your compassion will always mm. bring you back. So this is a story I sometimes tell because mm. it was a story where 
I'd got myself into a loop of being angry and then being angry about being angry and then mm. criticizing myself for being angry and then getting more and more angry and all that, those loops. Mm. Uh, but my compassion is I've just cut right the way through that and mm. just, I just settled. Mm. Yeah, I think we, we can, uh, many of us can sympathize with that, you know, or uh, in your case, it was about the, the computer and the general situation, but I'm, sometimes it's about uh, another human being, you know, yeah. I'll just, uh, you know, I just, uh, you know, uh, uh, effing, you know, uh, uh, kill that person, you know, wanting to retaliate and uh, <laughs> harm, actually harm other people yeah. because we uh, think they did something, you know, and uh, whether they did, they did or not, it's uh, well, it's not important at all. Uh, so, uh, so f thank you for for sharing this story. I think it's important uh, uh, and for for uh, for all of us, especially for the professionals, not not uh, having this ideal well ideal version of who should we, sh we should be. Because yeah. Yeah. I think that's a brilliant point. Yes, it's because you have an aversion of who you want to be, and then you end up ha in, at war with your own mind. You know. Mm fighting with your own mind and mm -hmm. feeling ashamed of what you thought or what you fantasized mm -hmm. or whatever. But these are all part of being human and it's how mm -hmm. we work with them as opposed to how we suppress them or get rid of them. Mm -hmm. um, so compassion is really about the ability to face the dark side. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. Mm -hmm. Have the courage to face the dark side and, mm -hmm. and not allow it to, I mean, as you know, like with mindfulness, mm -hmm. the idea of mindfulness is mm -hmm. not to control your thoughts. Yeah. The idea is for your thoughts not to control you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, it's important to get the mindfulness right, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like with compassion. Compassion is not to stop you feeling. It's mm -hmm. that if you do feel these intense emotions mm -hmm. or whatever, you have a way that they don't control mm -hmm. you, that mm -hmm. you, can, you don't act them out, you don't become harmful. But you can't necessarily stop them at mm -hmm. root. Sometimes you can, but... Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's that mm -hmm. understanding about what mm -hmm. it is you're doing um, mm -hmm. to to be in control of your mind in terms of what mm -hmm. you do. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So actually, you've inspired me to ask more questions, uh, uh, which I think uh, is inevitable. Inevitable in in, in your well, uh, whenever I'm having a conversation with you, Paul. So uh, uh, so uh, uh, these days from. Uh, uh from today's perspective would you do anything differently in terms of developing cft um uh and how do you see well uh, going back to to uh, one of my previous questions how do you see the future of of cft so any changes uh or any further yeah progress? i mean I, I mean you know it's always nice and i wish i no, I wish I knew yes. then what I know now. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You always have that in looking back. So I think some of the ways in which we discuss CFT, people mm -hmm. have got overly um, focused on the idea that compassion is about soothing. So soothing is important. It is an aspect. But, you know, if you talk about the compassion of a firefighter mm -hmm. you know, risking their lives, they're not in a soothing system, are they? Mm -hmm. Right. So soothing is quite useful when you're meditating and you're mm -hmm. grounding yourself mm -hmm. and you're trying to develop your self, your default mode and so on and so on. So that's important. So I think probably not to over because compassion is a motive and, mm -hmm. and the, the emotions and the thoughts and the behaviors you use really depends on the context. Mm -hmm. So that would be, and the other thing is that we used to talk about the two aspects of compassion, the engagement sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a bit cross with myself in a way because it's a basic algorithm, right? The algorithm of engagement and the mm -hmm. algorithm of action, mm -hmm. engaging and doing. And that's true with all motives. You know, it's the same with say eating, you know, mm -hmm. you, you feel hungry and you see food, then you have to go out and get it, don't you? Um, a lion sees an antelope mm -hmm. and has to kill it, right? Mm -hmm. If it says, oh, that's lunch, mm -hmm. but I don't know what to do. <laughs> what do I do now? Uh, that's not very helpful. So with all motives, you need mm -hmm. both the, to know and to be orientated to it, but also know what to do. Mm -hmm. Sex is obviously the same thing, being aroused, but then not knowing what to do. That's, that's not terribly helpful. Um, Compassion is the same, right? Mm. So I think we we can we we push that much more now than we did in the early days, mm -hmm. and helping people think about and there are different skills of engagement and there are different mm -hmm. skills of what to do, mm. um, and empathy you, it, is different according to whether you're working out what's happening for this person, whether they're feeling, as opposed to what is likely to help this person. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, like 
you know, for example, with somebody who's got a drink problem, they want another drink, but the empathic position is to say no and mm -hmm. to tolerate their abuse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the empathic position, right? That they're going to be angry with you if you don't give them a drink. Give me a drink, you bastard. Mm -hmm. I need a drink, right? And say, no, no, I'm not giving you a drink. Um, so th these processes really are um, understanding that they are different and they're fine-tuned and there are lots of variations to mm -hmm. them. And I think we would highlight that much, well, we do highlight that much more than, say, 10, uh, 15 years ago. So just being much more subtle, much more variations, mm -hmm. more multi-textures with Tim mm -hmm. Compassion, not seeing it just one thing. Um, you know, some people can be wonderful firefighters and will risk their lives to save you, but they might not be terribly empathic parents. Mm -hmm. not, you say, people can have skills in one area, but not in another. And I think we need to, to be much more sensitive to diversity and variation and to value what people can do as well as helping them with the things they can't do. Um, so I think that's that's probably what mm. we're trying to do mm. more of. Mm. Any other misconceptions, not only when it comes to CFT, compassion, but generally uh, psychology? Because, for instance, uh, uh, personally, I, I have problems with uh, such terms uh, as here and now. I think it's often misunderstood. So... Uh, in, in mindfulness, as you know, uh, uh, we often refer to this term, um, uh, but uh, actually in mindfulness, it's not about uh, uh, only solely being focused on here and now. It's uh, whilst being able to focus on what is happening uh, here and now, also taking into account uh, uh, the lessons of the past, uh, our past uh, histories and narratives, and also planning for the future. So actually, um, uh, Mindfulness is about combining these uh, these uh, three things, the past, uh, uh, the future and the present. And if we're only uh, focusing on the present moment, it's like another uh, obsession, you know, where we are not planning for the future, which might not be compassionate in itself, etc. So another uh, term I absolutely uh, um, struggle with uh, and, and at times even hate, I can be honest about it, it's being authentic, you know, like uh, being authentic to my Myself, so uh, I don't give a damn about what you're thinking. Uh, and as Han, the Korean German based philosopher says, being authentic, sometimes it's about being antisocial. So because uh, I don't, uh, I no longer take into uh, account other people. I only base my uh, me being authentic, authentic on my spontaneous emotions and emotions can be an important message, but can, they can also be a fleeting thing, you know, misleading. So, uh, and uh, the, the Israeli sociologist Eva Ilus uh, says that uh, uh, emotions sometimes are like commodities, emodities, she calls them. So what are some of the terms or misconceptions you struggle with, uh, Paul? No, I think that's fantastic. And uh, yes, I, I agree with, with those exactly. I, mean, I remember in, there was a, a, a Buddhist when I was on a retreat once who said that um, when they were in Thailand, there was a particular path they had to walk down to get to the where they slept the problem was uh, there were snakes about and he said so you had to walk down and really pay attention to where you were putting your feet he said it was a great training in mindfulness mindfulness by itself is interesting if you're going mm -hmm. to try to address the default mode and create experiences of non-duality right mm -hmm. self-transcendence and uh, all those things and that use of mindfulness to create these changes of mm -hmm. state. So you have an enlightenment, which is basically to do with this issue of becoming aware that we're part of everything and everything is part of us. But in terms of everyday living, what you're saying is mindfulness is to really regulate behavior. Mm -hmm. So that you, as I say, that you, you, uh, you, you don't regulate your thoughts, but you stop your thoughts regulating you. In other words, the whole point of mindfulness is that you can pay attention to intention. So my mm -hmm. intention is for me to mm -hmm. live compassionately. I want to try to be helpful, mm -hmm. not helpful. So I'm mindful if I'm actually starting to get pulled into becoming greedy or drink <laughs> to drink too much is my issue, um, or whatever, or wanting to be helpful or just mm -hmm. have an argument or be selfish or be hurtful to people. So mindfulness really grounds you in the present moment in order that this moment is not a moment of harmfulness. Mm -hmm. So I think the point that you're making is an incredibly 
incredibly important point is what is the point of mindfulness? Because mm. by itself, it has no point. Mm -hmm. Well, the point of mindfulness, as I say, in, in, for the enlightenment is to create states of inner mm. stillness such that mm -hmm. you begin to experience consciousness, the subtle levels of mm. consciousness. That's the point of it. But other you use mindfulness in lots of other ways as well, mm. but there is a reason for it. The, you're doing it for a reason. Mm. And it's just clarification about that. Then the other point you make is authenticity. Absolutely right. I couldn't agree mm. more with you, Julia. Mm. Well, authentic what? What, my compassionate self or my critical self or my mm. aggressive self, or my competitive mm. self, my sexual mm. self? What part are you talking mm. about? Mm -hmm. All right? So the idea that there is a single individual that has something to do with authenticity it just isn't like that. I mean, mm. we're a very mixed bag of different things. Mm. Um, so um, <clears throat> I don't think there is an issue of authenticity. Mm. My, and, I, you know, we've talked about this, I've written about mm. this. What there is an issue is to live to be harmful, not helpful. Now you could say, well, is that an authentic you? Or, well, it <laughs> might be. But it's mm. to do with the part of me I wish to identify mm. with. It's what I'm choosing to identify, mm. whether it's authentic or not. I don't know. Sometimes I will behave in ways that are not terribly authentic. Mm. I don't want to be harmful sometimes mm. i won't tell people the truth because i don't want to be harmful because it would hurt mm. them you know mm. so i think when you get a conflict between authenticity mm. to the other and uh, and that's been discussed in the in the therapy literature when are you absolutely honest with your client mm. you're irritating me or i don't mm. particularly want to see you because you bore me um that might be authentic but it's mm. not terribly helpful <laughs> so i agree entirely with you now the other one that's really a is the issue of love, which really annoys Oh, me. yes. Self-love, yes. Oh, oh love, yeah. Mm. So, so in the Buddhist position, right, and mm. it's really interesting, um, the concept of love is nothing to do with what we see as love. So love, mm. so if you remember, well, you know this better than most probably, um, the Buddha uh, was originally a prince who mm. lived in a golden palace because his father didn't want him to become a spiritual being and see suffering but eventually he broke out of his palace mm -hmm. and going down to the village he came across the three big tragedies of mm -hmm. life which was he saw people who were mm -hmm. diseased which was shocked him he'd never seen that mm -hmm. he saw people who were very old mm -hmm. and decayed that shocked him he'd never seen that and he saw death and that shocked mm -hmm. him he didn't didn't know that death was part of life right so those are the big three and then off he set and mm -hmm. for a while he traveled around for about four or five years he became an ascetic and did a lot of mm -hmm. mindfulness training and became emaciated he was almost at the point of death when he decided this mm. enough is enough i'm going to sit under this tree so he's in a highly emaciated state of a lot of confusion mm. right when he comes into this practice now what we know is that when people go into these states they mm. can have these shifts of mm. consciousness so he had a massive shift of mm. consciousness into a non-duality experience mm. now in non-duality experiences and there's a lot you can go and not you, because I'm sure you know this, but for those who don't know that, mm. go and look this up on the on the internet, Not just called non-duality. Mm. Mm. So non-duality means that you have this sudden experience that although you're a biological being, your true nature is consciousness, and consciousness is the ground of all being. Therefore, you have an experience that you are part of everything and that everything is part of you. Mm. And Dan Siegel has just written a book called Intra-Connected. Mm. Intra, not mm. inter, mm -hmm. intra-connected where he talks about this issue about this experience of one's true nature as a, you are a, a part of consciousness, that is your true nature. So in that sense, when you experience this, you have a, an experience of overwhelming connectedness, which you, you will, the mm. closest way people describe it is love. They can't ex describe it as any other way. Mm. Total and utter acceptance, mm. total and utter safeness. Mm total and utter connectedness mm. with all things mm. that's the only way they did, can describe it is love but it isn't like love mm -hmm. we've actually interviewed some for a documentary i've interviewed a non-duality experiencer and she said and she was fantastic actually absolutely really insightful but she said it's the only word there is no other word i could describe it to you but mm -hmm. there is so much in this experience it's indescribable you can't really describe mm -hmm. it Mm -hmm. But it's not like love as you would know it. I love you, you love me, blah, 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 blah. But the problem is that you, a lot of what's going on in the video now 
you know, you've got to love yourself and all that stuff. Yes. Total nonsense, actually. No, I wouldn't like to love certain parts of me, Paul. With due, all due respect, I think they're quite shitty, you know. Uh, yeah, so I, I can accept them, you know. I can understand yeah, their function, sure. but that's different from saying, oh, I absolutely love you. I don't. I hate you. And I think you're, you know, well, we'll go, not go into that. Um, but another thing... Uh, but acceptance, I, I think, is important. What yes. The yeah. distinction between self-love because mm -hmm. if you look at any dictionary definition, mm. it's about wanting to be with, it's about liking, it's about feeling warmth with, mm. okay? So you don't need to like these things. You, you know, you don't need to like people in order to want to help them. The surgeon doesn't need to like all the clients to do the best surgery he or she can, right? So when it comes to compassion, this mm -hmm. is about suffering. You don't make any distinctions whether you love somebody or you don't, whether you love that part or you don't. Is I don't want that part to suffer. That's it. I might not like mm. it, but I'm not. Mm. So the point you make is a very important one. But I think we we live in a culture uh, that's romanticizing things, or even maybe infantilizing things. Uh, you very much so. Mm. I couldn't couldn't agree. And it's it's typical narcissistic Western society, I'm afraid. Again, we might be referring to to Han. He he writes uh, wonderfully uh, about this. Uh, uh, mm. Uh, Han, Han, uh, he's uh, a Korean German based philosopher. I highly oh. recommend him. Um, okay. One of his book, uh, I think the title is The Disappearance of Rituals. Yeah. Um, also, uh, I, I think uh, what we're discussing is the question of uh, another term that uh, is often quite irritating to me is non judgment. So, uh, um, non-judgment uh, um, uh, is understood as, uh, 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 you know, I don't have, well, of course, it's it's about first seeing your faults and not uh, uh, believing everything you think or, in fact, others. Uh, but uh, in the end, we need to choose like a good doctor or, 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 a, or, a, or a wise judge. You know, we need to discern, you know, if we prefer to use another term, because without uh, uh, proper discerning, there is no compassion. I can just be you know, sitting here, you know, self-soothing and uh, don't give a damn. Uh, so... Uh, um, we need to make certain choices. Um, and another term maybe that we should make, uh, grill a little bit is happiness. You know, what do you think about happiness? You know, the, uh, um, uh, because it's often discussed in, in psychology or popular psychology. How do you approach it? Yeah, so I agree with, coming back to your first point, I agree with you about non-judgment because non-judgment is basically not fighting or condemning with your mind. That's basically mm. what it means. That you don't fight or push away and try and stop mm. or destroy or get rid mm. of it or whatever. But the key issue is non-judgment allows you to become discerning. Mm. Okay. So those, the point that you make is an incredibly important mm. point. What is the, how does non-judgment support discernment? Mm. Well, it allows me to discern on the basis of other things mm. apart from my hostile reaction. Mm -hmm. to something. I can actually discern something as to whether it's going to be helpful or mm -hmm. not. So the Dalai Lama, for example, spends his whole life traveling mm -hmm. the world trying to create compassion. He doesn't mm -hmm. say, oh, well, non judging, I'll just sit here and drink my tea. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it, it's really the process discernment is discerning in order to engage in compassionate action. So that's the key thing. Then it comes to happiness. And you're quite right about that, because there's a uh, hedonic happiness and, and drama happiness. I always pronounce that word wrong. But the happiness that comes from meaning and commitment to things. So, and happiness that comes from meaningful things may not actually create a feeling of happiness. That's different. Very, very much so. Mm -hmm. Right. So supposing I'm going to a party tonight and I'm thinking, great, I'm really looking forward to this party. Mm -hmm. And then a good friend phones me up and says, I'm in, I'm in a terrible state, you know. Um, is there any chance you could come over tonight and just spend some time with me? Because, so what do you do? Mm. Well, you probably go and see your friend, okay? Mm. Now, you give up the joy of the party because, and you go and sit and listen to somebody being miserable with you. Mm. Why do you do that? Because it's important to your values, right? And also in six months' time, what will you like to have done? Which will you be most happy with? Mm -hmm having spent time with your friend and see that you really helped your friend or have gone to the party and left your friend to wallow in misery. So what makes us happy is not necessarily what makes us feel happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very important to stress test. 
Yes, you know, you'd be feeling the sense of mm -hmm. joyfulness. Joyfulness is really, really important, and mm -hmm. I prefer the concept of joyfulness mm -hmm. to the concept of happiness. But yes, you, you're quite right about this. There's a lot of issues about happiness. I think the Delhi Lama's got a little bit caught up on happiness, really. But mm -hmm. of course, happiness in Buddhist doesn't really mean what it means in English. Mm. These translations of these words are not really good. It means really something that you feel that you're on course with something that's meaningful to you. You're living your mm. life meaningfully, and that's closer to the existential concept of mm. happiness. So, yeah, it's not just, you know, let's mm -hmm. have some fun and be happy. Mm. <laughs> yeah. so, so maybe going back to, uh, to psychotherapy, Paul, um, uh, what are some of the uh, uh, concepts... Uh, uh that uh, uh that in your opinion uh, opinion uh uh should be more uh um uh popularized uh, uh proliferated uh, and are not uh, that known or maybe highlighted enough yeah, so well, in, I... mm -hmm. so in short what do therapists still do need to know uh emphasize what is crucial well in compassion i think the key thing we focus on is courage and wisdom right I think these two things, people often miss that, okay, because courage without wisdom mm -hmm. can be reckless. Mm -hmm. So I see somebody fall into a river and I jump in to save them. Mm -hmm. But if I can't swim, then I just sink. So it's very mm -hmm. courageous, but it's pretty mm -hmm. stupid. Um, on the other hand, I might know how to save somebody. I might mm -hmm. have done a rescue, but for some reason, that particular day, I get an anxious panic attack and I don't do it. So I let them drown. So. <laughs> So wisdom without courage can be completely ineffective. Knowing what to do but not having the courage to do it is no good. Mm. So that this is really important for us, courage and wisdom is at the root of what compassion mm. is. Then you have ways of being compassionate. So as you know, we've done work on kindness. Kindness is not compassion. Mm. It's very important and we do a lot of kindness mm. training in our, and, you know, because it's about taking an interest in other people and so on and so on. And we've shown, we've done studies to show that Compassion, if you are thinking about being compassionate to people you don't like versus those that you do like, you get a bit of a drop off when you're thinking about um, people you don't like. You do get a bit of a drop in compassion, but you get a huge drop in, in kindness uh, mm. when it comes to people you don't like, like remembering their birthday. No. <laughs> <laughs> Helping them out with babysitting. No. <laughs> Won't do it. No. <laughs> so kindness. Is important, mm. but again, understanding how kindness mm. works. Kindness mm. is about creating uh, a sense of community, a sense of affiliation between people. Create a sense, mm. you know, I know that you think about me. I know that you care about me. Mm. These are all these are all very, very important. But they're not. Kindness doesn't need the courage and the wisdom that um, compassion does. Mm. So that's another one of our <laughs> our jointly. So the distinction between mm. being compassionate. Uh, uh, ways so assertiveness right is a mm. way of being compassionate sometimes you mm. know being truthful being honest and defending your position mm. not allowing yourself to be walked over compassion is not submissive just giving in to people so these are very important issues about the distinction between what it is and it's a bit like depression right so depression is a mood state we see it mm. as a mood state but there are many different symptoms that go with it it, mm. it manifests in different ways compassion is the same Mm. It's a dedication to address suffering. Mm. But there are many, many manifestations of, of, of compassion, mm. you know, kindness and forgiveness and assertiveness. They're all, you know, mm. part of it. And for people that mm. were close to love, if you want, for those individuals. So um, these are the things that I think are really important. When we get, Otherwise, compassion gets a little bit um, fuzzy. But mm. it's courage and wisdom to address suffering, basically. Mm. Mm. Combined. Combined, yeah. Mm. So in terms of uh, psychotherapy integration, um, uh, because I still have the uh, impression that there's so uh, uh, much uh, fighting going uh, going on between different, uh, uh, let's call it, tribes of, of therapists uh, and so little cooperation. I, I, I don't uh, know if you agree with me and uh, uh, please uh, disagree if, if you think otherwise, but... Uh, uh, so what do you think about that? And what's the uh, remedy? How can we co uh, be cooperating uh, more? Well, no, it's a wonderful question. And I'm, I'm, for those of you who are interested, I wrote about this in the, in the, in the first chapter of the new um, Compassion book about tribalism. Mm -hmm. And it's got a little bit like religion and 
mm. my garden's better than your garden and all that stuff. And also because the, the elephant in the room is money. Mm, yes, it's money. Exactly. It's about the money. You, you know, well, and do I have an RCT? Will, will an insurance company pay for this treatment? Can I have I proved it's effective? Mm. Can it? Be, can I prove it's better than that treatment? And now we're going to train people, and we're going to give them certificates, and they're going to join this little group, and they'll have a sense of belonging. And there's money, money, mm. money. So money, unfortunately, I have to say, and the desire for certain individuals to have that group identity. I'm, I'm me, and you're you. That that tendency for humans to get into tribes, that's really quite a problem. But, you know, the key thing as therapists, we should see these processes. Hmm. Um, you know, I remember going to a workshop, I won't say what therapy it was, but, um, and it was really interesting, they had some nice slides. And so I said, you, are you happy to share the slides? Because we always share mm -hmm. our slides. Mm. And they said, absolutely not. We don't want you sharing the slides. Well, why? What, do you want me to learn it? No, you've come to the work. You, you can maybe buy them or something. So ah. there's a lot of unethical behavior in mm -hmm. um, um, psychotherapy, I'm afraid. Now, we, we argue that we are compassion-focused therapy. In other words, the whole issue is to focus whatever therapy you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, bring compassion into it. So... And we're very open to say we use a lot of therapies. We do some mentalizing. People use EMDR. We use chair wear. Mm. We, Leslie Greenberg's got some wonderful stuff. Uh, there's some interesting stuff in the ACT community, mm. some fantastic stuff in the psychodynamic community, mm. like cannabis' stuff on uh, repressed anger. Mm -hmm. is so as a therapist, our responsibility is to learn the best mm -hmm. ways of helping individuals, mm -hmm. not to just try and make everything every clinical problem fit into your tribal view you know mm, mm, otherwise yeah. you get like a religion you know everything has to fit into my view of god no. cultish very much cultish cult maybe not a, a cult uh, uh, yet but uh, quite close yeah. to that yeah i recently had a conversation on on cults uh, uh so i'm happy to share that to uh, with you as i think we should all uh, be uh aware of the group dynamics and yeah, absolutely. Mm, mm. and i'm not you know we haven't escaped it mm. i mean cft gets set up as a cult as well and mm. uh, you know, uh, this individual and this great individual, whatever. So it's partly, but don't don't get caught up in the mm. projections. That's the most important thing. People will project all kinds of things onto you and they will want a sense of belonging. And these, these are important things and that's okay. We can be very happy mm. to have people uh, belong to the Compassion Focus Therapy family, but at the same time to be very respectful and interested mm. in other families around you. So it's not that we're saying that, that, you know, we're the best. Of course, we want to be the best. If we don't think we're the best, then we need to improve. Mm. There's no point in, you know, not wanting to be mm. uh, the best you can be. But it's this ability to relate to others in a way of respectfulness and open learning as opposed to I want to be better than you and therefore suppress you. Mm. Okay, that's where it gets into trouble because that's what competitive behavior basically is in the wild the dominant suppresses the mm. subordinate it stops them from mm. having access to resources that's what dominant behavior is about it's, it's the behavior mm. of control mm. whereas um, i think we should delight in our differences and learn from each other because there's so much to learn so improving rather than competing yeah uh, yeah yeah uh, Paul, being aware of the time, I have two last questions. Uh, sure. Obviously, I have many, many more, but uh, uh, let's focus on these uh, last two. So, uh, uh, first of all, um, you know, any any books that you've re uh, been reading lately that uh, uh, you'd uh, uh, be happy to recommend? Uh, uh, books that have inspired you, stimulated you uh, uh, in any in any way. Yeah, I've just mentioned Dan Siegel's book, which mm. I've been listening to, Bliss. Um, also, I, um, I, there's a wonderful book I like by Christopher Ryan. It came out in 2019. It's a bit old now. Old now. It's called Civilized to Death. Okay? Ah. And it's the way in which society has so moved us away from hunter-gatherer societies and that basically we're nuts, really. We've driven ourselves completely crazy in the ways in which we now live. So I think it's a, it's a, mm. it's a written, he's an anthropologist, so it's written mm. for an anthropology. So that's a, that's a, a great book. And um, I'm reading a very interesting book on the history of religion um, as a boast through psychedelics and how the church has suppressed mm. spiritual experience um, and the use of uh, drugs for ex ex exploring expanded consciousness. Because we're, we're doing a big study on 
um, Cyber Cyber and Magic mm -hmm. Mushrooms and Compassion with mm -hmm. colleagues in Argentina. And there is a there is a movement, I think, which I'm finding extremely exciting, where people are beginning to question the whole nature of what it is to be conscious. What is this consciousness? What is, what's mm -hmm. going on here? And some of the answers that are coming out are quite profound, really. Um, mm. Quite profound. So my last, uh, thank you, thank you for that, uh, for your recommendations, Paul. So my very last question is how to live according to Paul Gilbert. Well, um, I would always say live to be helpful, not harmful, appreciating that the human brain is a bit of a mess, really. Uh, we often think that, you know, evolution comes up with good designs, but it doesn't. And um, as you know, truly, we always say this, don't we? Um, if you think about the, 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 the women listening to this podcast, mm. right? Um, unfortunately, evolution have done you no favors at all because mm. when we stood up, the birth canal narrowed just at the point when the baby's head was getting bigger. Um, but the advantage of standing out hands-free overweighed that. But what it means is that human female birthing is the most dangerous and painful of all primates. Mm. And, you know, in hunter-gatherer societies, there's very high infant mortality. Mm. That's a dreadful design. It's mm. terrible. But that's what evolution does. It trades off one thing against another. Mm. Um, the same with your brain. You've got mm. stuff in your head that if you don't regulate it, can do some real damage to mm. yourself and other people. Now, that's not your fault, right? Mm. So the first thing when we live, when we work, uh, sorry, when we live to work helpfully is recognizing what you're dealing with. Mm. You've got a brain that you never chose that can give you all kinds of stuff. So what you would say, you learn to become mindful, you need to become aware, need, learn to become non-blaming, mm. but trying as best you can to take responsibility mm to live to be helpful and to be joyful to be playful mm. now of course if you're in horrible circumstances like in a refugee camp or something mm. or in an abusive relationship that's very difficult but it nevertheless if it's possible always remember that playfulness is very good for your brain okay mm. and if you get overly sucked into work and you're just coming home exhausted and opening your bottle of wine you're not really creating mm the style of life that's good for you. Mm -hmm. Learn how to play, socialize, <laughs> make sure you use friendships, mm -hmm. you engage in friendships, value your friendships, put time aside for your friendships. All of those things are really important for to live well. Uh, value the people around you, the ability to experience gratitude, not as a kind of, oh, I should be grateful, but as a joyful process, mm -hmm. right? Like talking to you, I'm very grateful to you because you do wonderful things for CFT. I love the way you think about things, putting on these podcasts, mm -hmm. you're spreading it because without people like you, then I'm just sitting here talking to myself, aren't I really? So, you know, the, the, the opening mm -hmm. up that mm -hmm. social dynamic mm -hmm. is a way in which you can live mm -hmm. well. So, uh, Paul, thank you for this uh, interview, for all your compassion, uh, and it's been a pleasure, and uh, do have a good life uh, saying this to you and to all of our listeners. Thank you yes, so much. We will see you again and chat again, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I do hope that too. Okay, so.